The patrons have spoken, and for your December patron pick, we have Baynet. Okay, I mean, I guess we're doing the Nightmare Before Christmas instead of just a Christmas-related one. Baynet is one of the darkest Pokemon of all time, even though it's not a dark type, because it's originally a plush doll that was thrown away by a child, then came to life from the power of the grudge and hatred it held for that child. It also curses people by sticking pins into its own body. Yikes. Today, we're going to examine if this funereal Pokemon Pokemon was able to channel its hatred into competitive success. And so, we ask, how good was Baynet actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. OU success was beyond Baynet's reach in its debut generation, as it couldn't hope to match the sheer all-around excellence of Gengar. In UU, however, Baynet had a number of nasty tricks it could pull off. Its normal immunity allowed it to switch into Tier Queen Kangaskhan, drawing a weaker move for a teammate to pivot into. Being able to dissuade Dangerous Choice Bandit Double Edges was also excellent. In a similar vein, it was able to withstand powerful Choice Bandit fighting staff from Hitmonlee. Baynet didn't just use its immunities to switch in, though. It's insane. Insomnia ability meant it could absorb sleep moves, which was particularly useful for switching into and thwarting the ever-irritating Vile Plume. Hitting the field safely could sometimes be risky and prediction-reliant, given Bayonet's frailty, but once it managed that, it was an absolute menace. Stab Shadow Ball threatened several other top-tier Pokemon, such as Hypno, Lunatone, Solrock, Grumpig, and Misdravis, and in conjunction with its exceptionally high attack stat, was often difficult to switch into. Shadow Ball was especially dangerous, since the few Pokemon that could take it were crippled by Bayonet that's will o -Wisp and Hidden Power Fighting, like Pokemon such as Aggron and Kangaskhan. To make things even worse, Baynet's knockoff removing leftovers from walls such as Granbull made it even more difficult to withstand, as well as opening opportunities for its teammates. Flexibility between these moves as well as leftovers recovery was useful, but Baynet could swap that out for the sheer power of Choice Ban, which meant its Shadow Ball threatened to two-hit KO nearly the entire tier, while HP Fighting absolutely crushed the few Pokemon that could resist it. Now, Baynet's normal immunity also meant it was immune to Rapid Spin, which alongside its offensive capability, made it a natural fit for fast-paced Spikes teams. It was good against him on top, since Will-O-Wisp would absolutely ruin it. It had to be careful around potential Hidden Power Ghosts, but since Hitmontop didn't match up well against the tier's number one Spiker in Omastar, then the Spikes would be insured against it. However, Blastoise, the tier's best spinner, both matched up very well against Omastar and easily two-hit KO'd Bayonet with Surf, not being as crippled by Will-O-Wisp. Instead of both Omastar and Bayonet being fairly good against it, as was the case to maintain spikes against him on top, they were both vulnerable to Blastoise and were thus unable to maintain spikes against it. However, Baynet could turn this to its advantage. With Destiny Bond, it would take Blastoise down as it went for the KO with a second surf, ensuring that spikes would remain. The trickery didn't end there though. On Destiny Bond sets, it used a Salak Berry, which faked Choice Ban and gave it flexibility not only in switching moves, but in opportunities, as in conjunction with Endure, it could get the jump on a faster Pokemon such as Scyther that expected an easy KO. Overall, Baynet was a great Pokemon in advanced UU, with a move pool the metagame seriously struggled to switch into. It required skillful play to compensate for its flaws, but the upsides were worth it, and with Destiny Bond, it even managed to turn its frailty into a positive. Unfortunately, yeah, you thought we forgot about that one, didn't you? The fourth generation introduced three excellent ghosts in the form of Miss Magius, Rotom, and Spiritomb. This already made things tougher for Baynet, coupled with the fact that it now had a weaker ghost stab with the new physical special split, meaning it had to use the weaker Shadow Claw over Shadow Ball, and Gen 4's power creep meaning Yu was generally a lot stronger. Baynet just couldn't find any sort of niche at all, and dropped down to NU. Sadly, even down there, it wasn't great. With Insomnia to block sleep and Shadow Sneak's priority, it could potentially anti-lead Jinx nicely, but it wasn't very good against the common Regirock leads. Beyond that, it could set up Trick Room, but was wholly unimpressive outside of that thanks to its lack of power, and competed with the generally more useful Dusclops, whose massive bulk gave it more opportunities to set Trick Room up. Baynet could potentially mess with the opponent with moves like Trick, Knock Off, will o -Wisp, and Taunt, but its lack of solid defensive utility meant it wasn't at all consistent at doing so, and thus was difficult to slot on most teams. The fourth generation was just entirely forgettable for Bayonet.
Gen 5 was cruel in its complete indifference to Bayonet. It got absolutely nothing new and had more or less a repeat of the previous generation. Even all the way down in NU, which was now a lower placement thanks to the existence of RU, it was completely unusable. There was no way it was competing with the amazing Golurk, and even if Golurk didn't exist, it wouldn't be worth anything. It was never breaking through Mandibus, and it couldn't stand up to the stampede of Tauros, Charizard, Jinx, Samurott, and every other threat in NU. Its immunity to Sock's close combat was nice, but getting thrashed by Sock's earthquake was not, and there was just no point whatsoever to using Bayonet and Gen 5 NU. As such, it dropped to untiered, and there really isn't anything more to say about it. Gen 5 completely passed Bayonet by. Cursed Body was a nice ability, but it wasn't anywhere near enough to vault Bayonet to any semblance of viability, even in the lowest tier. Thankfully, Gen 6 brought Bayonet a much needed buff in the form of a Mega Evolution. It received the Prankster ability, letting it spam priority will o -Wisp and Destiny Bonds. More notably, it received a whopping base 165 attack, letting it pick weak and faster Pokemon off easily with its priority Shadow Sneak. To make things even better for Bayonet, it was indirectly buffed with Steel no longer resisting Ghost and Dark, and the latter was relevant since Knock Off was now a powerful attacking move. Bayonet can now re-establish itself as a lower tier Pokemon, landing in Aryu. Its main problem was strong Mega competition in the form of Glalie and Camerop, two of the tier's best Pokemon. However, Mega Bayonet was well worth using, as it performed well against both offense and defense. Shadow Claw made it terrific at slicing through several of the metagame's most prominent bulky Pokemon, namely Jellicent, Sigilyph, and Uxie, and several other bulky Pokemon like Venusaur, Registeel, Alomomola, and Deancey that would be paired with them, and who would certainly not enjoy losing their item to a knockoff, and and or being burned by Will-O-Wisp. The threat of burn was also excellent as it kept pursuiters like Drapion and Sneasel away from Bayonet. They could even safely trap Bayonet one-on-one -on -one despite being faster thanks to Prankster. Speaking of Prankster, this is what allowed Bayonet to perform well against faster offensive teams as well. No matter how fast and strong the opponent was, Bayonet could take it down alongside it thanks to Priority Destiny Bond. In addition, Bayonet's ghost typing allowed it to take on Rapid Spin Blastoise a la Gen 3 UU. It was a Swiss army knife of utility for spike stacking hyper offense teams, who loved it for its ability to mess with defensive teams, keep offensive teams in check, and maintain their hazards against one of the most common anti-hazard Pokemon. Now, Mega Bayonet did have its flaws. It was difficult to fit in on non-spike stacking offense teams, as its overall utility was significantly lesser than that of its fellow Megas. Plus, it didn't have Prankster on the turn in Mega Evolve, and it could struggle to find a time to switch in and Mega against more aggressive teams, meaning it wasn't always automatically equipped with Prankster Destiny Bond. However, in spite of these flaws, Bayonet also also had a ton of great traits, and the teams it did fit on made the most of them in many ways. Mega Bandit made those teams tick. It was a specific but solid Pokemon in Auras RU. As for regular Bayonet, it wasn't so well off. PU was now the lowest tier, but Bayonet couldn't establish a niche even all the way down there. The buff knockoff wasn't great news for a frail ghost type, and as always, its offensive toolkit wasn't nearly impressive enough to justify its thoroughly meager defensive profile. As a result, regular Bayonet dropped to untiered again. Again. Bayonet's greatest relevancy in 2015 came at the hands of none other than Wolf Glick, who made it a miniature mission in the midst of the season to give Bayonet some results. Wolfie's first foray with Bayonet was at the Virginia Regionals, where he managed to secure 8th place with the team of Bayonet, Mega Kangaskhan, Cresselia, Heatran, Rotom Wash, and Landorus T. Just a few weeks later, Wolf was able to make the necessary adjustments to the team to get it into fighting form by swapping Kang for Mega Venusaur and Cresselia for Scrafty. These changes were enough to garner him him a first place finish at the Florida Regionals. But what did Bayonet bring to the team? Well, according to Wolf, not too much, to be honest. Venusaur was the driving engine of the team most of the time, and Wolf only brought Bayonet a handful of times. However, it had a nice bag of tricks when it did come. Wolf chose to ignore Bayonet's scary claws and scarier attack stat, instead investing fully into Prankster. In fact, Bayonet had no attacking moves at all. Its move pool consisted of Will-O-Wisps, Disable, Pain Split, and Protect. When Bayonet did come, its primary duty was to disrupt the enemy team. Bayonet is the only prankster user available with both Wisp and Disable, which let it shut down powerhouses on the physical and special side, with Wisps for the Kangaskhans and Mawiles, and Disable for the Salamences and Gardevoirs that Venusaur could struggle with. In addition, Wolf could will o Wisps his own Heatran for a Flash Fire boost, letting Bayonet indirectly contribute some offensive presence. The rest of Wolf's team was equally defensively minded. Heatran itself was also substitute Disable will o Wisps. Venusaur carried Leech Seed, Rotom and Scrafty 
Murphy were both bulky. If you're keeping track, that's two Intimidates, two Will-O-Wisps, and U-Turn Landris. Any Kangaskhan's nightmare. And that's probably why a team that was, by Wolf's own admission, pretty bad, managed to succeed so well. In Wolf's own words, the team was, quote, just stupid Wolf hyper defense, end quote. But that didn't stop him from winning regionals, and it didn't stop other players from trying the team themselves. Bjorn Johnson piloted it to third place at the Utah Regionals, and Eugene Tan gave it 15th at the Australian Nationals. For Amon, whose most terrifying feature is its destructive claws, Mega Bayonet went down in VGC history without even using them. Gen 7 was brutal to Bayonet. Its mega form didn't drop to NU, so at least there was that. But it would have been better if it had, because it was completely unusable in RU, and thus saw no usage whatsoever. The tier's best players tried, but there was simply nothing Bayonet could do besides trade itself for another Pokemon with Prankster Destiny Bond. On the bright side, thanks to Gen 7's new mega evolving mechanics, Bayonet would have Prankster as soon as it mega evolved. On the not so bright side, Gen 7 also nerfed Destiny Bond so that it couldn't be used repeatedly, meaning that dancing around around Bayonet's double down attempt became incredibly easy. On the even less bright side, using an entire Pokemon slot just to take an opponent down with it wasn't necessarily a bad idea, but it certainly was a waste of a Mega, especially when RU was rife with excellent Megas that didn't need to faint in order to accomplish anything useful. Blastoise, Sceptile, and Abomasnow were the main ones, but even less common ones like Ampharos and Glalie were more useful. It might sound like a harsh exaggeration to claim that Bayonet couldn't do anything besides Destiny Bond, but but it was absolutely true. Its offensive capabilities weren't only unimpressive, they were also completely and utterly outdone in every possible way by the dangerous Alolan Marowak. The only reason you would ever use Mega Bayonet was if you were a fan of the Pokemon, which was fair enough. But if you wanted to win, you would use several other meager Pokemon before even considering them. It's a shame it wasn't available in NU, as it probably would have been quite good there. But as it stands, Mega Bayonet remained uselessly languishing in RU. Regular Bayonet was even more pathetic in PU this time around. Nobody considered it for an instant. One of the top three Pokemon in the metagame, Jellicent, was also a ghost type, meaning that Bayonet was fated to be outclassed right from Jump Street. However, even if Jellicent hadn't been around, Bayonet wouldn't have been good at all. It was too slow, too frail, and too unimpressive offensively. And two of those traits are enough to doom a Pokemon, let alone all three. As such, regular Bayonet racked up its third consecutive untiered placement. And that's it! So how good was Bayonet actually? Well, it started off with a very cool, unique niche in Gen 3 UU, aggressively protecting spikes on hyper offense teams against Blastoise's rapid spin, and generally causing mischief with its powerful attacks and tricky support moves. However, as soon as the fourth generation came around, it dropped off a cliff and hit every rock on the way down. It received a stab nerf with the new physical special split, but even if Shadow Claw was 80 base power, it's unlikely it would have been enough for Bayonet to be capable of achieving anything. Shadow Claw would have had to have been at least 90, and preferably more. As it were, Bayonet was too slow, too frail, and just not strong enough to achieve anything, and was understandably left by the wayside. Its Mega gave it some brief respite in Gen 6 RU, but after Gen 3 UU, that was the second and last tier either form of Bayonet has ever been truly viable in. Everything else was a total catastrophe. If and when Bayonet returns to Gen 8, hopefully Game Freak will be kind enough to give it some new moves and perhaps some minor stat buffs. And as several other Pokemon have shown us, a little goes a long way. Here's hoping Bayonet can eventually snap its streak of being cast aside like a plush doll forgotten by a child. Thanks for watching everyone, and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and for voting for this Pokemon. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know, what do you think about competitive Bayonet? How would you buff it? Because it really needs it. Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.